your son walking through a field just been tilled up and little boy's hanging on to his dad's hand and he keeps falling down every time he gets to one of those little furrows in the ground little boy just falls down you know gets back up walks a little ways further little boy falls down again finally the young man wiser than his age looks up to his dad and says hey dad how about you hold my hand instead of me trying to hold yours because that way when the things get rough I know I can hang on to you. You know, men, I'm here today to challenge us, us, to be the men that our families need. Amen. Be the men that our children need. To not expect them to reach up and hold our hand, but for us to reach down and hold theirs. Amen. Grab a hold to them by the power of God. Like these men said, we're not perfect at all. We, in fact, we know we're flawed. Is there any amens out there? Yeah. I mean, I know Greg. But the rest of us are flawed. And we need, we need the Lord to help us every day to be the men of God. <laughs> but it begins with a challenge. I can always play with Brett. That's why I do that. Uh, I, I, it begins with our challenge today. And you know, we're facing a culture. Unfortunately, we're facing a culture that is minimizing the family. Yes. That is minimizing fathers. Yes. Is minimizing men. What has happened to our culture of manhood. What has happened to us? Snowflake. Oh, yes. <laughs> Amen. So today, I want to talk a bit about culture, about the struggle that we're facing as families, as men. And then I want to turn around and I want to show you. God has designed men to lead families. Amen. God has designed families to be the very foundation of his society. That's right. And I want to show you, I'm just going to show you five places that to me show us the importance that God has placed on families. Right. And therefore, if the family is the central component of society, who is at the head of that who has the responsibility to be a leader in that? Yeah. Men. We're not watchers. We're not complainers. We're not just saying, oh, the world's a terrible... No, we're leaders. We're called to lead our family, our culture, our children Amen. to the gospel. Amen. Yes. Lord God, I pray as we go to this, your holy word today, Lord, I pray that you would <clears throat> set aside whatever sermon I had planned today because I already feel your presence, Lord. Yes. <coughs> We want to be passionate about protecting the dearest people on the planet, our children. Yes, Lord. We want to be passionate about representing the, the most important person in our life, and it's not ourselves. It's, it's you, Father. Yes. We're here to represent oh, God, yeah. God the Father yes. in the way that we father our children. Right. And we know we're broken. We know we're hopeless. That's why we're coming to Holy Communion in a minute, and we're admitting our need. Yes. for redemption every day. We're confessing our sins and we're asking, Lord, for strength to continue on to be the men of God that we need to be. That's why we come to this communion. Yes. But Lord, it begins by understanding our importance in this society. And Lord, I pray for every one of us, men, women, <coughs> grandmothers, sisters, aunts, today, everyone who's raising children, needs to understand the importance of being the leader in their family that God called them to be. Yes, Lord. Lord, I pray the words of my mouth would not be my words, but yours. As we talk about this difficult topic, Lord, I pray the hearts be opened. We would stay sensitive to the needs of, the, of other people, but also come back to the truth of your holy word. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. So, I want to talk first a bit about the situation that we're in. Again, this all requires a lot of research on your own part, so I'm just going to wet your whistle. I'm going to talk about the basic, what I see as the four basic trends here that are attacking men and families. And that's where I want to go today, and then we're going to talk about what the Bible says. Because really I want to spend most of my time training us on what the Scripture says so you know where you're coming from. Let's talk first about the mainstream effect on family. 
the four four trends that are affecting our family in our culture today. And again, if you think about the founding fathers, if you think about the Puritans who came here, I think they would roll over in their grave if they saw some of the oh, things yeah. that we have allowed to happen. Yes. And I'm telling you, I, I have to admit, I have not been engaged enough. And you're going to see in a minute that uh, everything is local, but it goes uphill from there. I mean, we, we need to be engaged at the local level and the state level and the federal level Amen. because it all comes back to affect families, doesn't it? Yes, yep. it does. Our freedoms, how we live our lives. And, of course, the number one trend that I'm really concerned about today, number one, the redefining of marriage and family. Have you, have you noticed this in our culture today, that the whole redefinition of what family, what marriage looks like? Yeah. And again, I'm just asking you, who has the right to determine what is family? I get passionate because this is our word. Yes, it is. This has been God's idea. This was not human created. That's right. This is God's idea. Yes. And yet the world has decided and we have allowed it. I have to admit, we have allowed it Amen. as a people sitting on the sidelines of history to allow them to redefine what is marriage and family. See if this will work. All right. The first part of that is what I call gender confusion. Yeah. <laughs> Have you understood that we are redefining what a gender is? Do you understand that the current idea in culture is the concept of gender reality is a social construct, they call it. A social construct. In other words, just like we talked about last week, Truth is not truth. It's based on what you perceive it to be, what you want it to be, how you feel about it. Again, I want to be sensitive. There are people who have major issues. My psychological training and my years of ministry, I've seen major, major issues here. But it still does not change the reality of what is true. Amen. I even saw an article that now they're saying 81 different genders are available to you. 81 different genders are available. Somebody's very confused. So, I'm just saying, and so here's what this person says, gender is a term that relates to how we feel about ourselves, the way we choose to express our gender through makeup, dresses, high heels, athletic shorts, sneakers, and more. Wow. So it's really, gender becomes more of my impression that I want to give you. It's a fashion statement. It's an outward example of what I want. In other words, he goes on to say, gender identity then can change over time. It is not fixed. Wow. Okay? Just because you identify one way at one point in time does not mean that you will always choose that identity or that your identity won't shift and evolve. That's just messed up. And look, let me get down to the point here. Again, in psychological, emotional terms, your gender identity is directly connected to your self-esteem. If you have confusion in who you are, you will walk around in confusion as to who you are. That's right. If you don't understand your maleness or your femaleness, I don't know there's some who truly go through gender dysphoria, they call it, where you're confused or uncomfortable with your gender, you want to be something else. I understand. In fact, many of our young people go through a phase of gender dysphoria as part of their life. But what I've learned and what you need to learn is during those times, they are more insecure. They're weaker. This is not a time of strength. They think, I should have the freedom to have whatever gender I feel like. But instead, we are offering them more fear and more confusion That's right. and less confidence. That's right. Instead of giving them confidence and self-esteem in who it is that God has made them. Amen. And listen, I want you to understand too, it's not just confusion. There's also an element of control. I want you to understand that some of this battle, and I've seen it in the articles and in the writings I've read in psychology, that some are just in rebellion against society, against family, against church, against God. 
And all this is more of, look, I have the right and I'm going to push it to control my society. So in my opinion, we have the, we have the three options here. You can be confused, you can be controlling, or you can be confident. And listen, God wants us to be confident in who we are. Yes, He does. Even when you're uncomfortable with your maleness or femaleness, there are times when we wish we had other traits. We wish that we didn't have certain things. But Psalm 139, 13, one of Dana's favorite verses, For you formed me in my innermost being. Yes. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Amen. Marvelous. Yes. Marvelous are your works. Yes. You see, God made us, and I'm going to get into this in a minute, but we, we, we ask people to, to, to have family, and yet they can't even clarify their gender, and yet we're saying that marriage and family is built around a man and a woman or not, they get together. And see, if you take this down to a, a deeper level, you realize that that's why society begins to collapse. Mm -hmm. The very foundation is weak because we have allowed this diversity to happen. And of course, the second part of this is love, quote, love is the highest virtue. Love in this context means we accept you. We are tolerant of you. And of course, if you want to have, uh, if you want to marry that person or that thing, whatever you want to marry is fine if you love it. But you know, how unreasonable is this? Think about it a minute. Those of you that are married, is there anybody married in the house here? Oh, yeah. Are there minutes, moments? You don't love your spouse? Yeah. Are there moments when you'd like to get even with your spouse? Every spouse has moments when love is not there anymore, right? So what holds together when you don't love your spouse? Your commitment. That's right. In fact, what, what we do by making love the ultimate virtue is we have to submit truth to that. That's right. And in fact, here is the point, and I love, uh, I'm reading a book by Chip Ingram called Culture, Culture Shock, and he says this, in the name of love and tolerance, <clears throat> all sexual boundaries in Scripture are ignored. These, we, those we accept you groups refuse to balance their emphasis on love with truth. The actual place, they actually place a wedge between truth and love. Mm -hmm. By saying that you have to love people even when it's untrue. They make truth look like you're a hater mm. when you're trying to help them. And yet, all of us who have had kids know that if you love them, sometimes you have to give them the truth. That's right. In fact, uh -huh. if you, the only way to truly love someone is to love them in truth. That's right. And so, to, to raise this virtue up is somehow this is love to accept everybody and to allow them to do whatever. Is that true love? No. No, in fact, if love is not balanced with truth and fidelity and integrity, these other things that are true nature of love, whether it's marriage or country or whatever, then it's useless. In fact, love becomes sentimentality That's right. if it's not built on commitment. And then the third trend, which I think we all have to agree, is that sexual freedom has become a goal. Yeah. Has become a goal. Since 1950s, uh, suddenly we decided that every person should have the right to have sexual freedom. It means that we can do as we wish. We can have relations with anyone at any time for any reason and that has become the high goal the goal is not sexual purity the goal is not to hold up society and be a strong society for God the goal is my sexual needs have to be met period and I see this throughout it just really really concerns me how much we have been bought we have been sold this lie 
that if you are sexually free, you'll be free. Because I want to tell you here today, since the last 70 years, we have proven one thing. Sexual freedom is really bondage. That's right. It is not freedom at all. That's right. In fact, let me give you this hint in case you don't know. Real sexual freedom comes when you have what we call intimacy. Amen. And intimacy is between two people who have invested and built a relationship of trust Amen. to where they can come together in trust and truly unload themselves in freedom because they have that trust relationship. That's right. And so if we allow people sexual freedom to come and go and be with whomever they want, you break the very trust foundation of true intimacy. Amen. Amen. Whether it's sleeping around with other people, whether it's pornography, whether it's whatever else you allow into your family, doesn't that erode the foundation of trust, yes, it does. which makes intimacy possible, which gives true freedom. So in fact, the very idea of sexual freedom actually destroys the foundation of true intimacy. Amen. And so what the world has sold out for, let me move on. There's a whole sermon series on this sometime, but what the world has sold out for is a cheap feeling, an imitation of love. That's right. They sold out for the cheap yes, they have. instead of investing in the intimate, which is really the beauty Amen. of a marriage and sex between a man and woman who Amen. are in the right relationship, who trust each other, who have built a relationship to where they truly have sexual freedom together. That's right. Because I can be myself. You can be yourself. We can truly, as God designed it, truly be passionate together. Because there are no issues, nobody out there except you and me on this together. That's right. Amen. So, I know you're saying this is Father's Day. I know, but <laughs> let me just tell you these trends because it's going to come in later on. Number two that concerns me is government has wants to become the foundation of society yes, instead of the family. Amen. They want to, uh, an interesting trend is that people are moving toward government becoming this foundation because government will provide their physical needs. Mm, yes. And if the government provides their physical needs, then therefore we will sell out our emotional needs. And as you know, especially in areas like socialism, Marxism, communism, where our world is heading, our country is heading, guess what they have to erode before they can move ahead? Faith and family. That's right. Faith and family have to be taken off the plate. They have to be disarmed. They have to be weakened. So to me, I can see the dots being connected here that the government wants to be our Lord and Master in place of God. The government wants to tell me how, who I am and how I, how I deal with other people. And again, I just, I'm just concerned and I want to just lay it out there with you that we can't allow government to think they are the foundation of society. Amen. Mm -hmm. Because God has made family and faith the foundation of yes. society. Yes. And we need to keep that going. Yes, we do. Number three, something called cultural artifacts. Now, what in the world is that? A cultural artifact is those things, the, the art, the music, um, the TV programs, the video games, all of these things that are the cultural influencers in our society. Guess what? Those set the tone for our culture. Yes. So now let's talk honestly here a minute. Can you look at television and see a positive view of family? No. Can you even look at television and show me a father who you want to respect anymore? Now fatherhood has become some kind of joke. What happened to the good old-fashioned shows when you had a father who was a head of the family and a man of God? What happened to those guys? <laughs> yeah. So you see, we again, we've allowed ourselves to, to, to invest in these cultural artifacts that are now telling us what we're supposed to know and think about family. 
In fact, the funny thing is, is today families are put in a strange position because we actually have to protect our children from these things. Right. Instead of letting them watch it, we have to say, no, you can't watch this. Right. No, you can't watch that. No, you can't have that video game. Because there's so many values in there that are actually opposed to our Christian faith. Yes. And yet, and yet, who is going to do that? People who really care about the kids. Fathers, what does it mean to be the head of a household? You're the guard. You're the warrior. You're the protector. You're the one who needs to be the man enough to say, no kids, you can't watch that because that is not the values we stand for. Amen. I'm telling you it's tough. Amen. I'm talking to myself here because you can't say, do as I say, not as I do. That's you're right, watching, right. sitting there in front of that TV program and saying, no, no, you can't watch it. That's right. Does that work? Nope. Yeah. <laughs> nope. So we have to begin to deal with the cultural artifacts. Everything from art to music, to video, to TV, That's right. to news, yes. all this. And please, please be, oh, don't be naive and think there's not an agenda. Oh yeah. Don't be naive and think that there's not an agenda underneath even our news programs. I mean, they all yeah, have their own agenda. Yes, they do. Liars. And so we have to be wise in that regard and realize that if they're going to set the tone of the culture, they're going to affect our children yes. and us. Yes. And then the last trend, which has been happening for many, many years, is work and prosperity becomes our identity. Yep. Let me tell you, um, today work is thought of about self. Especially for men, our work becomes our identity, our badge. I do this, I do that. I'm doing this. And, and then that becomes where our priority and our focus is pressed trying to please our boss at the neglect of our family. Yep. Mm -hmm. So men, we can't allow ourselves to get trapped in this vision. In fact, the current stat makes me almost sick to my stomach. The current stat says that men spend about five minutes a day with their kids. <coughs> about five minutes a day on average with their kids. I'm talking about in a real conversation, not with the TV, not with something else going on, but in a real conversation, the average man spends five minutes or less with their kids. Fellas, we gotta change that trend, don't we? Amen. Yep. Yes. Broken marriages, unparented <laughs> children, pornography, abortion, and most of all these other culture wars all come back to the family. That's right. They all come back to home. Like the man said on the video, all these cultural issues end up coming back to a strong family. That's right. And that's the way God designed it. And men, He put us as the head of that family. Yes, yes. Yes. We're not the dictator. We're not the one who has authority over the family like we own them. But we are the one who are going to stand before the Lord. One of these days, stand before the Lord and say, I did this or did not do that for my family. We're going to have to answer for it. That's right. Yes. And we need to take responsibility. So let's talk now. Thank you. That's where we're sitting at today. But I want to talk about the upstream affirmations of family and fatherhood. I want to, I want to get into the positive now. And I just want to say this with all boldness and charity today. Family is God's idea. And fatherhood is God's design. Yes. Yeah. This is God's idea. And fatherhood is God's design. He put you there on purpose. <laughs> he could have designed it however. I mean, He is God. He could have done it however. That's right. Yeah. He could have put two, two of the same sex people together. He could have put two men together in the garden. He could have put two women. We got a lot more done if we had two women together. <laughs> but he, put, he didn't. He put a man and He put a woman together. Yes, He did. He designed it that way. Yeah. He designed it ultimately for there to be the differences right. that men together that women bring their strength and men bring their strength together yes. so this is his design yes. his way and if you would turn with me to genesis yes. we're going to look at the five affirmations of family and fatherhood just for a minute before we get to communion here but our key our key verse for today is from genesis chapter 2 
verse 24. The first part of this, again, is God's idea and God's design comes from Genesis chapter 2, verse 24. You know Adam and Eve were put in the garden. You know that God brought all the animals and all the creatures to Adam saying, hey, can you find some work? Does this work? Can you imagine all these animals coming to Adam and saying, how's this work for a mate? No, I'm not going to do that thing. <laughs> no way. I didn't know we were near, we were near that thing. That's right. But he brought all the animals and said, is this going to work? Because, you know, God said over and over, all this is good. All this I've created yes. is good. Yeah, yeah. Except for one thing. What did he say? <clears throat> it is not good for man to be alone. That's right. We need, we need the partnership yes. of family. That's yes. right. Because how can we follow the admonition of the Lord to, to go and produce and multiply and fulfill the earth? How can we do that by ourselves? And. I don't even think we can be successful in the garden by ourselves. No. I don't think that life can be together without, and, and there are some that God gives, the gift of singleness. <laughs> Believe me, it's a wonderful gift. But God's design here, let's look at it, okay. in Genesis 2.24. He brings Adam and Eve together, and then he says, look at this, that this is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife, and they become one flesh. Now let me, let me break this down for you in simple terms. Notice who is the leader here. Who is the one who is being directed to lead? The man. That's right. The man is the leader here. God said, didn't say, Eve, you've got to leave your parents. Didn't say that. He said, to men, you are the leader here. Your responsibility is to leave your parents and then, notice this, to be united with your wife. Yes. To be united with your wife means to mend together, to become together. To, it means much, much more than sexual union. It means... It means emotional, spiritual, physical union in every way, shape, and form. Yes. Because look at the final result. That you may become one <coughs> person. That's right. One person. One identity. Now again, we're going to talk about these trends in the future too. But I think this idea of our individuality, our idea is that even in marriage and family, we want to maintain our own individuality. I hear you. I'm so, a lot like that myself. But do you see what it says in the Bible? What the ideal is, is not that you would be two individuals in a marriage, but that you would all become one flesh, yes. joined together. And this is why when we truly come together, God's design is that we are one person working together as one. Unified in that. So please understand that I believe God designed this. It was His idea to start with. Number yes. two, God's Torah, His Torah, the first five books of the Old Testament, we have the law of God given to us. 613 laws given to us in the Torah. But what's interesting is God gives us these laws and these rules, and in them are all these rules about family. In other words, this is a huge emphasis in God's rules and laws is to establish the roles and purpose of the family. In fact, we know in Genesis 1.28, we have this, and God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the land and conquer it. And you shall rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the sky and all the animals that are upon the earth. So he said, your, your purpose is to multiply. How about these in the Ten Commandments? We have honor your father and mother. A great family connection, something so important. How about do not commit adultery? That's right. Is that not a family yes. marriage yes. issue? Yes. yes. Why? Because adultery will destroy the family. Yes. It will. How about the last one? Do not covet. People forget that it says, thy neighbor's wife. That's right. <laughs> This is where love becomes lust. Yes. Yeah. And you're coveting someone else's wife. What are you doing? You're lusting. And even that 
is nothing more than pornography or that's anything right. else when you have an emotional connection mm -hmm. to someone else besides your husband or your wife. That's right. That's a problem. And again, the rule, the, the list goes on and on here. So many laws. In fact, it also makes it clear the Torah, the laws of God, tell us what we, who we cannot hang out with. Mm -hmm. And you shall not lie carnally with your neighbor's wife to defile yourself with her, Leviticus says. And just in case you need to know, and you shall not lie down with any beast. So you cannot do bestiality either, just in case you don't know. That's that. right. Leviticus 18. Yeah. <laughs> Listen, God's whole law is designed to strengthen the family and to keep it as the center of society. Amen. And then he goes on to say, number three, God's people were divided how? By tribe, by family. And this society became, remember these 12 tribes under Jacob, became the very organizational structure of the society of God's people, didn't they? Yeah, yeah. He didn't have a king in the beginning. He had it divided by families. And guess who were at the lead of each of these families? The fathers. Amen. The fathers, the grandfather. They were over the administration of their family. So for much of Old Testament history, God set up his whole structure as a temple on top and then the families underneath. And this was the very structure of society. You turn to Genesis 49 sometime and see the division of the 12 sons of Jacob and how God set it up. He gave their land, territory, according to their family. And they would gather together according to their family around the temple. This was important to him. And then look at number four. Then we go to God's new covenant, the New Testament. You say, well, sounds like family's an Old Testament concept. Not at all. Jesus himself affirmed this, didn't he, in Matthew 19? Yes, he did. And then Paul further affirmed the rules and the roles of fathers and parents and families. And so we find in the new covenant, when Jesus came, maybe he could have written a whole different rule, a whole different strategy, but he didn't. That's right. He continued the old one and even made it more central in the New Testament. Remember, Jesus says right here, haven't you read that at the beginning the Creator made them male and female? How many genders? Two. 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 Eighty-two? Two. 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 Oh, two. two. Made them male and female and said, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and those two will become one flesh. So Jesus reaffirmed yes, Genesis yes. 2.24 into the new covenant yes, and is. adds this. So they are no longer two but one flesh. He repeats that. Yes, he did. Therefore, please see this. What God has joined together, let no one else separate. That's right. Amen. Listen, what he's Amen. saying there is God is bringing people together. <coughs> Marriage is God's idea. Family is God's idea. He brings together, and when, he, when you get together, He wants you to last to the end. No one should separate. That's right. And then, of course, Paul says, Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. Yes. Listen, we submit not to the man. We submit to the Lord. That's right. Amen. And the man is fulfilling his role there. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church. Again, men, you think, oh, I'm the head of the family. As Christ is the head of the church. He died for us. What did Christ do? He died for us. Amen. Not only died, he lived for us. Yes, he did. Yes, he did. He stood up to the opposition for it. He suffered. He suffered for it daily. Yes, he did. Yes. He went around trying to build this kingdom for the sake of the people. Hallelujah. He wanted Thank to build you. this church. He, he wanted to grow it. Yes. He wanted to refine it. Yes. He wanted yes. to present it to yes. God as yes, a holy he place. Yes, he did. This is what we do, men, when we're the head of the church, when we're the head of the family. We are trying to help our family become all that God has for us. Amen. Yes. Mm. Amen. As Christ is the head of the church, His body, of which He is the Savior. Yes. Now, as the church submits to Christ, don't we submit to Christ? Yes, yes we do. Aren't we under Him? We should yes. be. We are. Yes. So also, wives should submit to their husbands in everything. And husbands, listen. Love your wives. 
just as Christ loved the church. And what? Amen. Gave, Gave himself, himself up yes, he for did. Her. Yes. Thank you, so, Jesus. When we see the new covenant view now that marriage, family, that fathers are to be the head of their family just as Christ is the head of the church, just as God is the head of Christ, it all fits a wonderful plan, doesn't yes. it? God had a design of how He wanted to run the world. Yes. And men, we are part of it, fathers. Yes. We are part of this plan if we choose to go with it. Amen. Number five, and I love this one best, God's relationship with us. A few years ago, a German scholar was doing research in the New Testament, and he discovered that in the entire history of Judaism, in all existing books in the Old Testament, in all existing books in the extra-biblical Jewish writings, dating all the way back from the beginning of Judaism until the 10th century A.D. in Italy, all this time, there's not one single reference of a Jewish person addressing God directly by his first person as Father. Wow. wow. Not one one reference in all of Judaism they could not see it he says the first Jewish rabbi to call God father Jesus. was who? Jesus <laughs> Jesus Christ Wow. and you see that number beside it 175 plus Yeah. he, not, he didn't do it one time he did it over 175 times oh, praise God Use the name Father to represent a relationship that we have with God. Yes. Now, of all the things, of all the things David used shepherd, I can, I can sort of see this as an impersonal, Lord is my shepherd idea. But no, Jesus said, Father. Yes, he did. In other words, he put our relationship with God in context of the family. That's right. And in context of we, the men, as the Father, as God is the Father of this people, we so are Father to our family. Amen. Man, that moves me. Because I know He's a good, good Father. Yes, He is. And I know that we can never be worthy enough to be a good Father like Him. But I also know that Jesus framed this whole thing in terms of family because he believed in family. Yes, he did. And so Jesus said, this is how you should pray. Come on. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Amen. This is the words of the Lord's Prayer from Matthew. And I just want you to know that this is why everyone freaked out when Jesus started talking. This is why they picked up stones. They say, are you trying to say that you are the Son of God? Then he says, and I'm trying to say that all of us are. All who call the name of God and believe are the sons of God. Mm. Thank you, Jesus. So I just love this. I mean, this to me, number five, is this <coughs> last for sure affirmation of the very role of fathers in the family Amen. in the whole society of God's work. <coughs> now I want to make clear to you, they did a research, they did a study lately, of the three dominant forces that shape our kids' worldview. <coughs> and one of them is surprising to me, I didn't think. The first one is great, parents. That's right. We are still the primary influencer so far. Yep. Especially younger children, as they get older, as they go through puberty, as they become <laughs> young adults, we lose some of our influence. And then they get old, they get about 35, and they come back and say, wow, you were smart. <laughs> Yeah. But until then, we're pretty stupid for a little while there. But listen, parents. Listen, fathers. You want to raise a child with a biblical worldview, don't you? Yes. Amen. I hope you do. 
I hope you're here to raise children that know the Bible and love God. Now, we can't force it. We can't twist their arm. We can't make it happen. But we can sure bring them up in a biblical worldview. Of course, number two is obvious, media. They say by the time a child graduates high school, they would have spent 16,000 hours in front of media. Oh, wow. Television, social media. 16,000, that's right, two years. If you put your child in front of the television for two solid years, what would they learn from that? Like I said, this is the cultural artifact that, that you, is used to transmit and train our mind. What does TV stand for? Tell a vision. They give you tell a vision. They're, they're visioning, they're giving you a vision that the TV wants you to have, the media wants you to have. Because, man, you've got to go buy their product. Yeah. Boy, if I could look as good as him, I'm going to go buy that product. Yeah. You know? <laughs> they, can, they can use all kinds. Now, the third one is kind of interesting, because I didn't expect this. But today's world, they say that law of the land. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. The government, what the government approves of, our children think must be right. Mm -hmm. If the government allows it, it must be correct. And so we, they have this idea that the government is on our team. And for the most part, I want to believe that too. But there are some places where I know they're not. And unfortunately, I have to admit, I haven't engaged enough at the local level to keep the government from teaching some of these things that are outside of God's plan. So, fathers, I told you this because we still have an influence <coughs> until that child gets up to an age where they don't want to hear anymore. We need to pump it, pump it, pump it. Teach them the word. Mothers, you do a great job. Dads, we do a terrible job. Come on, we need to be the leaders in teaching our children the Bible and the biblical worldview. Come on, is there an amen? That's right. Amen. We need to do it. We want y'all. Men, we need to say no on certain media. We need to yes. understand that media, you know, anything that goes into multiple senses, yes. eyes, ears, yes. has a huge effect on us. That's why we use multimedia in this room. Because we know it helps you get the point. But it's also a danger. Yes, it is. If we allow that multimedia to train our child's heart, from a young age and over those years, 16,000 hours of beating that drum. And then we have to engage at the local level, state level, and the federal. We have to fight these political battles. Yes. Because these laws of the land, they affect how we live our family. Yes. How we can, how we can minister to them. All right, guys, right quick. Father's role. What's the father's role in, the, in upstream living? Here's the encouragement I have for you. I know it's been a heavy message, but this is so important to you. Listen, be the head of your family. Yes. Let's be the head of, your fa of our families. I'm talking to me here. And let's be a father to our children. Yes. Let's take the responsibility of being that head. <coughs> Again, we are not doing it as if we are some kind of dictator. That is not the role of God here. In fact, but I want you to realize, Paul said, that the head of every man is Christ. If you have Christ at the head, then everything else will work out. Seek first His kingdom and all the other things. But then the head of the woman is the man. You have to step up as a leader and say, I will take responsibility to help you, to lead our children, to teach them, to be an example to them. And the head of Christ is God. That's right. Even Jesus was under authority. That's right. If He was under authority, and we are under authority, then the family must be under our authority too. But we have to be men of leadership. Number two, self-sacrifice on behalf of the wife and children. I've already read Ephesians 5 to you. But we are to lay our lives down. Yes. This is not some kind of ego trip. This is not what we say, well, my, my needs, my wants, my desires, that's all that matters. Because this is totally agapeistic. This is totally, and it's not 50-50 either, it's 100-100. Right. You see, because this leads to number three here, 
I think work needs to be your part-time activity. What I mean is I don't mean you need a part-time job, but I want, I want you to realize that when you come home, your family is your full-time job. Amen. Yes. Your occupation, your vocation is your part-time work. Yes. When you come home, then you're entering into the arena of your full-time work. Because no one else is going to raise our children but us. No one else is going to show them the truth but us. And I know we're all living in days when we think we have to have all this stuff. All this money. All this stuff. But until I can get your encouragement, I want to encourage you to focus instead of trying to be successful at your work. Let's try to be successful at our home. Amen. For our children. That must be our first priority. Yes. While they're young, while we have the influence that we have. You see, time is the currency today. You can have all the money in the world, but time will go away. Yes. And so many of us will look back and say, oh, why didn't I? I was chasing that dollar there, and I sold out the time, and then it's gone. Yep. How many of us will say at the end, boy, I, I hate that I spent so much time at home. I really can't believe I spent so much time with my family and my kids. No. Quite the opposite. That's right. The grieving soul of a man or woman who says, Man, I gave you everything except for me. That's right. And the last thing, man, be an example. Be an example to our children for the spiritual growth and character. Yes. And again, we can't be a hypocrite on this. We can't say, do as I say, not as I do. That's right. We have to be an example. I want to show you this Deuteronomy passage. Because Deuteronomy 11 says, fix these words of mine in your hearts and mind first. Look, man, you can't lead someone else if you don't have it yourself. Fix these words of mine in your hearts and in your minds. Right. And then tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. I don't think you have to wear the box like the Jews do. <laughs> but you see what he's saying? Your yes. hands are what you do. That's right. Forehead is what you think. Mm -hmm. What he's saying is, make my word everything that you do and think should be according to my word or in light of my word. And then look, now verse 19. Teach them to your children. Teach them. Take responsibility to learn these words. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down, when you get up. You know what it says? Even when you're going to McDonald's. Yep. Use it as a biblical moment. Yes. Okay. Hey, guy. What do you think about this? How was school today? Oh, I had a hard time. What did you do? Well, what would God say to you? What do you think? Let me tell you a Bible story about a fellow who went through a similar thing as you. Write them on the door frames of your house. And even on your gates. Don't be ashamed and let the whole world know. That's right. Amen. Who you are. So that your days and the days of your children may be many in the land the Lord swore to give your ancestors, as many as the days that are the heavens are above the earth. Amen. And then lastly, Ephesians 6 4 says, Fathers, do not exasperate your children. All right, all right, men. You can't drive them crazy. Instead, we want to bring them up in the training. And instruction of the Lord. Amen. Man. All right. A great encounter happened in South America. A president of South America was being interviewed. And someone said to him, said, well, how come South America, remember now, South America, you know, a big whole continent, was actually discovered before America was discovered. Okay? And they believe that South America has even more resources than we have in North America. So they asked the president the question, how come South America was discovered before America, it has more resources, and yet is still lounging behind in terms of society and prosperity? And he had an insight for every one of us today that I want you to hear. The president replied, South America was settled by Spaniards who were seeking gold. Mm -hmm. North America 
was settled by pilgrims who were seeking God. Amen. <laughs> and he said that whole thing makes the difference. Yes, it does. If you're going to seek God, you're going to find Him. If you're going to seek gold, everything else will die. Lord, I thank you for this word today. I pray as we go to Holy Communion now that you would open our hearts to receive this word. And Lord, we just know that we come to this, your table. We're unworthy of it, Lord, but we come honestly and earnestly in your presence. And we just thank you for the opportunity to come. In Jesus' name. Let's pray.